Um, welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us uh, today for our presentation by Elisa Maria Hima, who has joined us today from Frankfurt because the, um, the <laughs> trains are, are going, but the regional trains are not. So um, we are the lucky ones today. <laughs> um, and Maria, Elisa Maria, um, did her PhD at the University of Wiesen, where she also received a prize for um, the best PhD dissertation um, of this year in 2019 about um, recent Polish Jewish and German Jewish uh, literature. And since 2019, she's been working um, as a postdoc researcher at Gerda Institute. And um, today she's going to speak about uh, part of the first project that she's been involved there, um, which uh, will result in a monograph on interwar Polish discourses about non-marital sexuality in abortion. And she has also already started her second project uh, with the Herde Institute, where she examines different narratives and mapping strategies of post-war cities in Central Europe. Um, so her research is based on the intersection of uh, history and literature and uh, centered on narrativization of our words. So this is especially interesting uh, for a number of uh, research uh, areas that we have at the BCBSS. And so we are very much looking forward to, uh, to your presentation today about um, abortions within the context of uh, maid servants in interwar Poland. So the floor is yours and thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Once again, first, uh, of course, I want to thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to, to come to Bonn. It's been really a decade uh, since I was here last time. Um, and in my talk today, as Jenny already mentioned, I will shed light on an issue that I came across while I was working on my uh, book on family planning and interwar discussions about sexuality, especially non reproductive sexuality, non marital sexuality. On the topic of legitimate children, um, I researched, and this is really just a little aspect um, I came across here. Um, in the overall project, I examined around 16 court cases of abortion trials and neonaticides. And uh, one of these cases I will also present to you today. So I've read a little overview for, uh, about what I'm going to tell you or um, I'm going to present you during the next 40 to 45 minutes. Um, Today, I will tell you about Gabriela's story. Um, she worked as a maiden in Tumor, Poland, in Swarovski, a little town in Poland's northeast. She was raped by the employer and got pregnant. She underwent an illegal abortion for which she was sued in court in 1937. This is also a story about how lacking state sovereignty and inequality fostered poverty that affected women in particular. It is a story about how gender, gender social scripts influence decision making in court. For 123 years, Poland was divided between Prussia, the Habsburg monarchy, and, and Russia. After its resurrection in 1918, the country faced manifold challenges that particularly influenced women in rural parts of the country. To explain challenges at that time, I start with an outline of the social economic. And social and economic features of interwar Poland. And to understand the social status and expected role of a maid, I like to give examples based on different kinds of sources, how sexual and economic entitlement to a maid were constructed. And then I will introduce my case study from the district court in Sobaki. I wish to explain why the public opinion in that particular region considered female employment as linked to prostitution um, and how does this actually affect the view on the left back then? And also ask which kind of misconceptions about sexuality of women that influenced the criminal investigation and the judgment in court. So my first chapter, the historical background. Um, the outbreak of World War I significantly increased gender imbalance and influenced sexual behavior. Young men were taken to the army. The historian Kili Stoltenhalstedt describes the consequences for the women remaining in their towns as follows. Desperate women, many of them wives of recruits or workers displaced by the war economy, turned to paid sex in unprecedented numbers to feed starving fatherless families. Rates of prostitution and sexual disease skyrocketed as furloughed soldiers sought entertainment during major reliefs passing armies to the advantage of female civilians 
The desperation everywhere made sex a key medium of exchange. Besides destroyed and neglected infrastructure, lack of housing and unemployment, a high rate of sexually transmitted diseases or existing issues throughout the whole interwar period. The First World War and its aftermath also caused severe problems related to reproductive choices. And prostitution as the only source of income led to, led to clandestine abortions and neonaticides. Let me show you a map of Poland. Um, after regaining its independence in 1918, and before that, uh, that date, you can see here how Poland was actually divided. The blue parts are, uh, were part of Prussia, orange or yellowish parts were part of the Habsburg monarchy, and the green parts were ceded to uh, Russia. Um, after this independence in 1918, the country faced, faced the challenging process of uniting three parts that were very different concerning infrastructural changes and regards with regard to healthcare, education, industrialization, and jurisdiction for more than one century. The first post-war phase of consolidation was permanently interrupted by territorial conflicts. I listened um, <clears throat> and wrote them down on the slide as well for you. So um, uh, yeah, these conflicts with the neighbor states were followed by the Great Depression that also influenced Poland in economic terms leading to a hyperinflation. I once read a source stating that the prices actually doubled every 19 days back then. In parallel, feminine, a female emancipation developed through employment as well. Due to the lack of work and being often the only person to feed a family, women often went to bigger towns to secure their living and underpaid jobs. The Catholic position was against paid work for women and the propaganda in favor of it was perceived as a leftist tool to manipulate them. Fear of upsetting the social fabric through female employment was an issue that received attention in the media. Catholic magazines centered their notion of family on a woman being, I quote, the guardian of good tradition, custom, and civic virtues. Secular daily newspapers frequently depicted individual losses, sticking to a narrative that problematizes female employment as a catalyst for moral liberalization, on which, as I argue, most of the society was not ready. Um, I don't know if some of you are familiar with Polish language, but I thought it would be nice just to see how that language looks like. So you have usually always um, the quotations in the original and in English. Um, and now the quote. The great preponderance of women prevents a large proportion of them from contracting legal marriages. Professional work, which is necessary in these conditions, has made women materially and morally independent. It has brought about fundamental changes in views on various areas of life, much greater freedom of habits. Meanwhile, the ideas of advisory centers for conscious motherhood and the upbringing of children by the state affect a large part of our society, like a red flag during a bullfight. At the same time, however, people from the same political camp turn away from the mother of an illegitimate child with indignation. She gets birth, she wants to bring it up, but who will employ her? She wanders, starves, and finally faces death, threatening both her and the child. She's young, she wants to live, she chooses the child's death. This newspaper article gives insight into the entanglement of social, health-related, economic, and moral challenges for women and labels their work as born of necessity, not of emancipation. Questions related to birth control are directly linked to this. Abortion often remained the last resort to ensure employment and a living for themselves and their family members. Unlike other countries in Europe, Poland experienced at that time a strong demographic growth and the high birth weight rate was seen as a main factor in the impoverishment of the country. In the case of Poland, modernization was at the intersection of new gained national independence and social and economic insecurities. But as in every other country, transformation to a modern society was associated with the promise of progress and leveling of differences. Indeed, an influential activism for more liberal lifestyles was present in all spheres of life. Let me show you just some examples of yeah, the media, um, quite popular advertisement on the right-hand side 
for um, Olagum, it was a yeah, preserved uh, condom, um, at a thousand for condom. And on the left side, you see a cover from a weekly or a monthly, I don't remember, which usually depicted quite like spicy stories on sexuality and everything related to partnership. And here we have uh, their original title is um, Mirror Pranks, alluding to an unwanted pregnancy um, and a woman that obviously enjoys her sexuality. <clears throat> so what we can say is that sexuality and especially non-reproductive um, sexuality was like step by step also detached from adultery at that time, but really like step by step. So even though there was a growing awareness and acceptance of modern changes, I argue that the values of society remained conservative in the sense that they were based on a clear idea uh, of how men and women should behave. Another topic that is relevant for today's talk was the codification of the Polish law. Until 1918, three different criminal codes were in power. And from 1918 onward, the new established Polish state relied on a translated version of the format Tsarist Penal Code. On the backdrop of women's rights movements, also in, on insecurities and hyperinflation, new regulations on abortion were passed on July 11th in 1932. The newly introduced and unified penal code, also known as the Makarevich Penal Code, <clears throat> legalized abortion in three cases. If there's a threat to the woman's health or life, if the pregnancy resulted from a criminal act like rape or incest, or if the woman was under 15 years of age and was thus the most pro progressive law on abortion of its time. So a little wrap up what to keep in mind uh, for today. Um, it's especially about the two contradictory, contradictory narratives. On the one hand, discussions about sexual behavior and partnership practices became more open. We also observed growing female independence due to higher employment rates. There was also awareness for precarious conditions that had to be fought. On the other hand, discussions about women's independence, both in economic and social and sexual terms, remained judgmental and conservative at its core. If a working woman got pregnant out of wedlock, public opinion seemed to have found proof for the moral decay that conservative voices criticized. A headline in a newspaper asked in 1933, for example, a woman capable to use their freedom? A Polish bishop regarded the interwar period additionally as an epoch that was withdrawn from Christ. Nonetheless, social initiatives raised awareness and were influential enough to influence the liberal law regulation of 1932. However, the protocols of the Codification Commission give insight that their members considered the negative image of single mothers and their children and acknowledged the socioeconomic struggles of women. Suggestions to legalize abortion also on social grounds were, however, dropped. <clears throat> and now um, the chapter about the public opinion of maids, about maids and how they were constructed. And I would like to start with a quote from literature. Bogotovna was the natural child of a widow who served around the local mansions as a cook and then no one from her family in the area, it seems. When they start to learn, I wonder who will work then. These are quotes from the novel Pranica by the famous Polish writer Sofia Nowkowska that mirror the society's view on maids and how little these women could rely on social networks. Usually far away from family or other relatives, they had to handle their life alone and their children, deprived of education, later worked in similar positions. The household members for whom they worked usually did not appreciate a maid's contribution since she was easily to replace due to the high number of people desperately seeking any kind of employment. And here on the right side, I brought you some um, classified ads from a newspaper. On the left, we have the, um, yeah, the, the ads from the employers. They say, they, um, yeah, I hire a maid for everything. This was the common term, the Duchess Gago means for everything. Um, she has to be clean, eager, and talented. And on the right side, we have ads from the from the potential future mates. And uh, the, the larger ad we have here um, says that I don't have friends or family in Warsaw, so I do not even need a day off because this only day off was the excellent bonus that could be negotiated back then. 
And, and here she's actually offering to, to, um, not to make use of this one day. So accepting it, offering worse work conditions could possibly, yeah, increase the chance of employment. So the requirements for being a maid were low and so were the conditions, 16 to 18 hours a day. And as I already said, one day a week off. The media shed light on the social class this woman usually came from. Leaving the parental home behind was seen as one of the risk factors in the life of a young maid. The narrative claimed that the pulsating life of big cities, the juvenile naivety or physical needs um, were accelerators for social decay. The maids often cut off ties with their families and little or nothing was known about the backgrounds, which added to the image of the alien young woman, woman that made them an easy target for suspicions of robbery or affairs with the employer. In a memoir of the Polish writer and social activist from Kraków, Lucina Kotarbinska, who used to employ maids, we read, my husband was unsurpassed perfection for her. Also the best coffee with milk foam was given to him and always with a certain discretion so as not to offend me. The common bourgeois conception was that all serving girls were prostitutes. A survey on sexual, sexual initiation from the interwar times pre-war time, sorry, found that the majority of male respondents stated to have lost virginity to the maid or the cook at their parents' house. I would like to present a quote from the survey. If you mention resistance on the part of the maid or passive and reluctant submission, while others again say that she did not let herself be asked for a long time. Some outright say that they consider this type of woman to be the most accessible and at the same time, the most hygienic. One of them, for example, when asked if he constantly has relations with one woman or more answers, it depends on each time the servant changes. Also sex advice literature for young adults added to the picture that sex with maids or prostitutes were acknowledged as common practice for sexual initiation. Regarding consensual partnerships of these women, we can say that maids' very limited free time and the little money they earned gave them also very little opportunity to enjoy or develop any kind of social contact outside the workplace. Proportionally, unwanted pregnancies occurred quite often in this group. In 68% of my court cases on abortion, the women said that they worked as maids or cleaners. Socioeconomic pressures that did not allow a maid to leave their refusive workplace or to report to the police. No. Yeah. Um, additionally, moralistic education as provided by advice guides for maids added to insecurity and passiveness. I would like to add that in general, since 1900, there was really a blossoming, um, like literature, advice literature was blossoming at that time, not only for written for maids, but also like um, instructions how to employ a maid were written. Also a lot of on sexual behavior was, was published back then. So um, here I have an example on the right and um, left side from Kajimi Jaride. It's the memoir for girls serving in towns. And he calls maids to a life of devotion and thankfulness <clears throat> where misfortune in life and poverty has to be accepted as God-given. God and he advises them to examine their consciences if they have moments of doubt. In the chapter, Work and Suffer for God, he advises to, I quote, work fast, thoroughly, clever and tidy, neither for the landlords nor for the money, but for making God happy. The author's approach to sexual self-determination is described best by the chapter titles. It, they say, for example, abhor sin like a serpent or keep angelic purity. Yet the question was, to whom this advice was actually addressed, since the majority of maids were illiterate or had low literacy skills. Indeed, the number of women with no or very limited reading and writing skills is obvious from the court file statistics. Only 12% I found were fully literate. The educational system was established a few years after Poland gained independence. The constitution of 1921 imposed compulsory education in Poland. However, in the Sowaki region, teachers were lacking, so that even educational staff from other parts of the country were transferred there, which means that the inhabitants there could not enjoy the education as required by the state. A 
In every day's working life, mates could not count on respectful contact. Very telling in this regard is the renaming of mates who had listened to every name the family addressed her with. A woman, woman born to a business family from Wood remembered the interview her grandmother had with a mate. <clears throat> Do you have a boyfriend? Yes, madam. That's very good. I'm happy for you. What's his name? The embarrassed maid wriggles and says the name. That's a nice name. You can have free time with your boyfriend on Sundays. Thank you, madam. And what's your name? Sasha, madam. That's also a nice name. But if I call you Basha, Kasha, or Yasha, I want you to know that it is you I'm calling for. And I want you to come here if I ask for it. What all these examples show is how the public opinion created the misconception about maids as being property, which was the basis of true menace of a maid's everyday life, sexual abuse or rape by the employer. Often rape victims did not report to the police since they almost um, automatically risked unemployment. Getting pregnant from rape made the woman's situation even worse. In general, pregnancies were hidden as long as possible because a pregnant woman was not seen as able to cope with the physical world. In consequence, a woman who would lose her room and as she was usually not local, an unemployed maid was a homeless person. Another solution was to hide the pregnancy until birth. In the Savalki archive, there are some cases where women gave birth alone or either tried to leave the newborn behind or to kill it or to give it to a shelter. Another very common way at that time was to entrust the child to the care of other women or sometimes men as a paid service. It was an immensely growing business in the medieval period as Kuchel for the Shack states. But given the overall lack of housing, basic sanitary and nutritional supplies, the person in charge took the money often and neglected or even let the child starve. Uh, and it's so common, there's uh, even an, um, a word for it, it's called angel makers. It was like an euphemism at that time. It is important to add that not only business families were the main employers, but also farm owners. This is especially important for my case today. The Savauki region was mainly characterized by small or medium agricultural farms that allowed a modest living standard. Working on a farm or as made for slightly wealthier farmers was the most common form of employment in that region. What brings me already to the next chapter? And let me introduce some regional and regional features about the economy and the society there. <clears throat> so Sowalki, and maybe you now you know where we are actually. So in the most northeastern part of Poland. Sowalki is a small, a small town in Poland's northeast next to the Lithuanian and today's Belarusian border. The city had about 20,000 inhabitants during the interwar period. The newly created Voivodship of Białystok, <clears throat> to which Sowalki belonged, was particularly diverse in political, economic, and ethnic terms due to the, to the post war border shifts. It shares some typical features of the interwar transformation. The population of the town grew by a third during 1918 to 1939. In terms of economics and society, the district was characterized by agriculture. Due to its peripher peripheral location near the former borders of the partitions, the infrastructure of the villages was not well developed. Yet, Sovaki rose to become an important garrison town thanks to the barracks inherited from Russia. The social life of the town was influenced by the military presence. <clears throat> As Magdalena Borowska Rushinska points out, Intuasabauki was famous for its balls in which the tone was set by the wives of the military. So Aki's population size and military presence allowed for a growing cultural scene and nightlife where it was easier for men and women to make contact and to hide their relationships easier than in the countryside. This provided a specific work environment for young women. Being a garrison town, the number of professional prostitutes was relatively high compared with other cities in this voivodship. The number of registered prostitutes for Sovauki was 51, which doesn't seem so much, but it is astonishing since Sovauki, uh, there's the city itself, um, and the county were less than half as big as Białystok, where 70 prostitutes were officially registered. 
but it would go too far to claim that Slovakia attracted young women primarily because of sex work. Way more common was so-called occasional prostitution, but it affected women from all parts of the society. And here you have on the right side uh, another headline from the local daily Gendopregim Slovatske. Something you don't talk about, you don't even want to think about. Women descending into the abyss of debauchery. Next to work, a graduate. Next to a maid, a clerk. It is true that the theoretically increasing number of public sex in the Polish lands had reached near crisis proportions, as Kili Sorter Halstead argues. But true to the specific conditions in that town, it was overlooked to which extent young women from poorer families were exposed to sexual abuse during their employment as maids on farms or in houses. Economic pressure and a misconception of sexual availability affected both maids and prostitutes. This connection was established already in Petition Poland. In a 1906 brochure dealing with the reputation of maids, we read, someone once said, it's getting harder and harder to get a maid and brothels are overcrowded with prostitutes. Unfortunately, there is a link between the two phenomena. Statistics show that a significant percentage of prostitutes are recruited from among mates. The author added that employers felt superior, perceiving the employed women not as staff, but as serving creatures. Therefore, workers' rights did not apply to them. To escape this abuse of power, prostitution proved to be more profitable. This added to the picture of mates being suspected of living a double life. The negative opinion of this group of working women probably made policemen and lawyers and judges overlook the rape in the following case. As I said, it's the case of Gabriela. She's a 27-year-old illiterate woman and a single mother. After one year on the farm, she got pregnant by her employer, Josef, the 57-year-old farmer, so 30-year-old man. Excuse me. Gabriela and Maria, the midwife, were accused in 1937 of performing an illegal abortion. Before the police in Saini was informed of the abortion by the local physician <clears throat> to whom Gabriela went after the procedure, Gabriela herself reported to the officers being raped by her employer. She claims that she was lured by a cousin to the midwife's practice where she met Josef. He negotiated the price for the surgery without Gabriella's consent. I quote, I saw him giving her some money, then he left. Interestingly, Yusef had not been interviewed, nor did he appear in court. And the midwife's testimonies are contradictory. She confirmed that Yusef came to her to negotiate the price of the medical support and, other and another witness confirmed that he had left food for Gabriella at the practice. That was 50 kilograms of potatoes, a couple of kilograms of peas, a piece of pork fat, and 50 groschen in cash. Later, Maria claimed that it was her who provided Gabriela with the food. Since the midwife was previously sentenced for abortions, she probably feared a severe sentence and wanted to appear in a good light. She made Gabriela speak in her favor. I quote, Maria is a good woman. After the accident, she gave me a swatty for bread twice, so I would not go hungry. She also convinced Gabriela to claim that the termination of pregnancy was caused by a fall from the stairs. The forensic expert's opinion remained unclear as to how the miscarriage was introduced, uh, induced. For having lost the job, Gabriela was beaten by her mother and brother. She, this suggests that Gabriela also was the breadwinner for her original family, which include an illegitimate six-year-old child. For most women employed in private houses or on farms, even one child presented a real threat to earning a living, since single mothers were not likely to be employed. The violent reaction of her family to her unemployment could have been out of despair, since the main source of income was gone, or out of disappointment for the like, misbehavior of getting pregnant out of wedlock again. <clears throat> Besides this problematic family constellation, it is particularly disturbing that the accusation of rape was not acknowledged and investigated by the police. 
where it was one of the three conditions that allowed for an abortion on legal grounds after 1932. The first case summary after having um, after having heard all witnesses reads. So it was investigated, but not thoroughly. Um, an investigation was carried out in this direction, in which the guilt of raping was not proven, which, however, does not exclude that the possibility, the possibility that he had amorous relations with the maid Gabriela. Not only are the pages uh, which could give evidence of this investigation missing, the astounding link between rape and love affair is created in the statement out of the blue. In Gabriela's words, there is no doubt about the sexually abusive character of this encounter. So on the first Sunday, I don't remember the date, it was winter time, he raped me. And then in a short time, he raped me for a second time. I got myself under control and cried, but he comforted me that nothing will happen. When I did not have my period from one month and another, I complained to his wife, who having learned that I was pregnant, banished me. This was in December of 1936. They banished me on Friday and on Tuesday, he came to see me. He didn't tell me that he was going to take me to the midwife, but he told me to go with him to town so he could buy me some bread. And then he took me to the midwife. I didn't know what would happen and said that the midwife would only examine me. During the examination, she told me to lie down and she did something inside. And the next day I started bleeding. The former maid's account is interesting and in so far that it has a lot of characteristics of direct speech, which the clerk seemingly wanted to preserve in the minutes. The incomplete sentences and the oral structure of the text show her way of expression. The vocabulary is not very elaborated, often redundant. Gabriela cannot remember the correct date, which is often interpreted to the disadvantage of the victim. Indeed, in the main hearing, there is no word about the rape she even reported. It is noteworthy that she describes her will to keep herself under control during the rape, which points at the extent to which male desire is to be satisfied through a woman, even without consent. That statement was also interpreted to her disadvantage. Since Gabriela did not actively defend herself, her accusation seemed not trustworthy. This corresponds exactly to Kutzel Fredishak's findings on a similar case in the 1920s. A 13-year-old girl was raped twice by her employer, and even though the forensic medical reports confirmed a broken hymen, the judges questioned the girl's credibility. In that specific case, judges first claimed that it was not possible for him to have raped the maid, as he knew that his wife and children were just in um, next to the kitchen. So it, here they allude to some sort of moral common sense or something. Statements based on misconception about rape were quite common in the files I researched. What we know from contemporary research on trauma and sexual violence is that there is no age limit or a definition of a victim's correct behavior during the crime that would turn the testimony more trustworthy. However, these cases were beyond the judge's imagination and challenged their understanding of morality. Not only the widespread misconception of maids being only camouflaged sex workers gave employers grounds to force them into sex. Also, rape was perceived as a ridiculous issue back then. The media published short stories, jokes, and illustrations promoting the image of women always being shy and basically waiting for a man. I quote, if you can't convince a woman with words, you do it with a kiss. That's an advice from the weekly Amorek. I, um, I showed you already cover a couple of slides ago. These aspects can also explain why jurisprudence did not put much effort in investigating rape since, since it was publicly perceived as minor issue. When she learned about her pregnancy, she confided in Joseph's wife. The farmer's wife regarded her need for help as spread and lie and simply kicked her out of the house. Not only was she replaced, replaced quickly, but also all parties of the trial obviously took, obviously took advantage of her naivety. Gabriela's testimonies became contradictory, but it's not up to me to decide on the case in a heuristic sense. What the files will ever prove is the position Gabriela had. On the one hand, Gabriela was pressured by the midwife to invent an accident and to underline the midwife's kindness, 
On the other hand, food supplies can be seen as another form of hush money. The Bill of Indictment reads that Gabriela allowed Maria to perform the abortion, which cannot be proven by the statements I found in the files. It was not the first time that the midwife was sentenced for performing abortions illegally. For this reason, the verdict for Maria is unusually harsh. Three years of imprisonment, disfranchisement, and the loss of any other civil and political rights for five years. Gabriela had to accept a one-year sentence in prison with a three-year probation. She never pleaded guilty. This is in so far an unusual as in almost all cases where women had illegal abortions, women quickly pleaded guilty and even adopted their testimony to gender scripts. That means they made themselves appear as morally inferior, which corresponds also to the wording we often find in the verdicts, like low intellectual skills or lacking life experience or moral education or intellectual immaturity. <clears throat> All these words were used to explain a mild or an average punishment from the judge's perspective. Women who stated to have an illegitimate reason, therefore pleaded non-guilty throughout the whole trial, received a more severe punishment. At least she was freed from the obligation to pay court fees. What the judges perceived as inconsistent witnessing ignored that victims of rape could not leave abusive situations easy. Their only option was to stay, which was interpreted as a sign of mutual affection or at least irrational behavior. Additionally, informal human trafficking was flourishing, and the women often agreed to work under the worst circumstances, since hunger is a despotic master, meaning that they were not likely to leave the job because the conditions elsewhere could be even worse. In this case, it added to the perceived untrustworthiness of rape victims when they maintain contact with the aggressor afterwards. <clears throat> Gabriela stated that she stayed controlled about her feelings, so she remained silent and did not show any kind of physical or verbal resistance. The accusation of rape was then reduced to, I quote, sexual relations that she had with the inhabitant of Saini, Yusef, at his insistence. According to the decision of the appeal court in Vilnius, the midwife's sentence was partially lifted and reduced to two years of imprisonment. However, her loss of the right to vote pointed at the threat that the abortion business posed to the national self-image. Maria was deprived of the power to decide of the country's future. <clears throat> so now my conclusions. The destinies of maids give insights into the social fabric of that time and show the entanglement of sexual liberation, female employment, and entitlement of the privileged. The precarious situation of the women was exploited in that way that they were forced to be sexually available. Recent research found that also other male members of the households could take advantage of employed women in private businesses at, and homes were seen as appropriate testing partners for young men's sexual initiation. Female behavior was subject to a far more moralistic, was subject to far more moralistic judgment. Pregnant maids could not count on the support of their employers' wives since their relations were often overshadowed by concurrence and jealousy. I argue that the gender dispense in court is another factor for the misinterpretation of female accounts. Jurisprudence was that part of citizens' life which was exclusively run by men. <clears throat> Exposed to the male gaze in lawsuits, accused women sometimes had to stand before a jury with whom they probably shared a background or a neighborhood. The author of a 1933 article addresses the heavier moral judgment on women in court as follows. Um, <clears throat> so she's alone, truly alone. She, the girl from the street, she, the child killer, she, the one who grabbed a gun or slapped the acid into the face of the one who betrayed or disgraced her. She will be judged. She must speak about her tragedy to these distant and strange, dignified and prosperous gentlemen. The universal assumption that all serving girls were prostitutes underlined the lived reality that the sale of sex had penetrated the bourgeois imaginary. I claim that this stereotype also influenced judges who used the paternalist narrative. 
rape would have been a legit reason for termination of pregnancy in this case, but this accusation was not investigated further. The only hint that would have ensured her agency was dropped and even turned into amorous relations, as the previous quote showed. Gabriela was described in the final verdict as a victim of bad treatment. Her actual destiny was invisibilized. Instead, stress was put on her behavior that seemingly did not correspond to what Smith and Skinner define as rape myth. On the function of rape, rape myths incurred, they say, <clears throat> rape myths have tended to focus on traditional gender norms. In particular, Moore noted that media reporting on rape has used myths about rape to create cautionary tales aimed at women, outlining appropriate or inappropriate behavior. This, she argued, was in reaction to increased female freedom and was the reason why so many myths focus on the cautionary tales of intoxicated women, flirtatious women, or women having informal relationships. Rape myths can therefore be understood through Lawrence Way and Fitzgerald's description of their cultural function. To explain and justify sexual violence, which is disproportionately experienced by women, in such a way as to maintain the status quo in relation to gender norms. <clears throat> Given the fact that newspapers described such trials in a voyeuristic manner, all what might remain from that story in this public moral verdict. Since she was sentenced, she must have been guilty of something, maybe an affair in abortion or paid sex. Because this is what corresponds to the stereotypic image of her employment situation. In consequence, the liberalization of abortion law must be reconsidered. It is true that into opponent was in a pioneering position against the global trends in family planning. At that time, Polish jurisprudence guaranteed women's access to abortion under certain circumstances. However, the most relevant reasons for unwanted pregnancy, like poverty, unemployment, lack of education, abusive work environments, did not play a role, and thus the number of illegal abortions remained high. The trials proved precarity to be the most common reason. Women had abortions to maintain their underpaid jobs, to be able to feed existing children, or to ward off precarity after delivery. I wish to end on a note that basically applies for all research on Central European countries. It is important also to stress what caused the precarity in the first place. The partition powers that rule over the century, over over the country for over more than one century, intentionally decided to leave the Polish lands in their modest agricultural condition as the granary for their empires. The Polish provinces never shared the fullness of the economic life of the respective empires. The little prosperity of rural inhabitants opened the vicious circle to unsafe and abusive work environments. What I described today must be also framed within the hegemonic oppression that relied on depriving peoples in Central Europe of agency. Thank you for your attention. And here are my sources, references. I'm looking forward to the discussion with you.